turning this evening to the book of Proverbs, chapter 27. And I want to look at the opening verses in this chapter. I'll read verse 1, but we shall work through the opening verses. Proverbs, chapter 27, and verse 1 reads, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And really, our subject this evening is wise words to the natural man. And by the natural man, we mean the earthly-minded person. How flawed is our thinking by nature? We are born into a natural world, and we have an earthly way of thinking and defining things and observing things. Some would call us earthlings. We are focused upon the here and now, but the Bible speaks of the spiritual man, the person who has a sense of the unseen, of eternal things, of a glorious, unseen, and yet living creator. Because we are fallen creatures, we are wholly focused upon the natural world. And that's what we mean by the natural man or the natural person. It's what we are immersed in. It's the way that we see things, and yet not completely. The spiritual world may seem distant and uncertain, and yet even for the natural man, the earthly-minded person, the unconverted person, there is a sense of the spiritual world. We have consciences, and those consciences give us an awareness of God. Why are there so many religions in the world? Why is it the vast majority of people think of a higher being? Conscience. Bears testimony. We have that awareness. And even the atheist, and perhaps this explains why so many atheists are militant in their hostility and their determination to prove the non-existence of God is because they are fighting against the testimony of conscience, that inner voice which the Lord, the Creator, has given to all of us. Creation declares the existence of God, the intricacy, the detail, the complexity. In recent years, Scientists have made a full discovery of human DNA. And yet that has really opened up a world of complexity that man did not know existed before. Certainly Darwin didn't know it existed. And that complexity bears witness. It has all the hallmarks of a mighty creator. The information contained in one chromosome defies the logic that man and the natural world happened by chance. And yet, despite the fact that our consciences and creation bear witness that we have a maker, we are estranged from God. We are alienated from God. Adam, our first parent, fell into sin, and as a result, we are alienated from God. That's why we focus upon this life. We live as if there is no God, no eternal world. The natural man, if I can use that phrase, I hope you understand it now, the natural, earthly-minded person is so often bold and self-confident and unwilling to be challenged and corrected, 
determined that they are right, and yet concealing chinks in their worldview and their approach to life. Well, here in these verses are several words of counsel, wise words to the natural person. And some of us here this evening, that's what we are. If we do not know the Lord, if we've never experienced his converting grace within our soul, we're focused upon the here and now, we are simply people with a, an approach to life that we can call the natural man. And there are seven things in these opening verses in Proverbs 27 that will challenge us. If that's our thinking and that's our approach to life. Look at the first one here in verse 27. The natural man is confident of tomorrow. Now, all of these character traits, they are stronger in some, weaker in others, and yet they are the underlying thinking, realistically, of our society. And the first here, confidence in tomorrow. Now, of course, everybody knows that one day will be their last. But the way that most people think, unconverted people who focus upon this life, they always assume that tomorrow will come. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Here is a great challenge to the sure-footed, presumptuous approach to life of the earthly-minded person. You know, even the elderly always presume that they're going to live at least another day. Of course, we must provide for tomorrow. This verse is not saying that we should live completely as if today is our last day. We must provide, anticipate our needs for food, uh, the needs of our family, we must study, if we are young people, planning in our minds a career. We plan and we provide, but we should not boast. The idea here is of someone who perhaps not outwardly, inwardly, their thinking is, I'm going to live tomorrow. But tomorrow is not ours to boast about. Somebody has said, tomorrow is like an is like an unknown birth. We don't know what it's going to bring. And therefore, we should be cautious. And this is especially so when it comes to the needs of our soul. If we are to be ready for our last day, then we must, as the scripture teaches, repent of our sin and call upon the Lord and seek his mercy and forgiveness but many, a natural person, an earthly-minded person, when their conscience says, you're not right with God, they will say, inwardly at least, something like this, tomorrow. Or when I'm a little bit older. And this verse specifically speaks to that kind of thinking. Are you ready to die? Have you sought the mercy of God? Have you op openly acknowledged and come clean before your maker the fact that you have broken his laws and opposed his claims upon your life and lived your way? Don't boast of tomorrow. This is the greatest business that you must attend to. This is the f ought to be the primary agenda for everyone here if we've never Come before the Lord and sought his grace and forgiveness. Don't leave it another day. Your lease on life may run out this very night. Then bow the knee and seek the forgiveness and salvation of your soul. These things are too important. Beyond this life, there is an eternity, a never, ever ending existence for every human being. We are in that sense immortal. 
but our destiny will be of one of two places. And the scriptures make that clear. So this is the first word of counsel to the earthly-minded person who only thinks and provides for the here and now. Don't presume that you have another day. Deal with the needs of your soul this very hour. But secondly, these verses speak to another trait that marks the natural man. The earthly-minded person is often confident in himself. Look at verse 2. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Did you notice this is written in the book of Proverbs? Proverbs is a selection of parables. And of course, on a very ordinary level, this verse is true. And it will say something to us each in our earthly relationships with one another. No one really likes to see or likes someone who's constantly blowing their own trumpet, drawing attention to their gifts and attainments and their uh, achievements, to their good looks, to their possessions. Everyone despises a self-promoting person. But this verse speaks far beyond that ordinary level of self-promotion. This mindset is deeply rooted in what we may call the natural man, especially when it comes to religious virtue. Well, I'm a good person. A person may come before the Lord and speak of themselves. If ever they pray and say, well, Lord, I'm a decent kind of fellow. That was the parable that the Lord Jesus Christ told of the, par the Pharisee and the publican or the tax collector. The Pharisee came before the Lord and he thanked the Lord for all that he was, all that he'd done, the fact that he'd not done all these open and wicked sins. He blew his own trumpet before the Lord. His prayer was a catalogue of virtue and achievement. But it was foolish. The natural man so often thinks that he is right before God. We may think that our opinions and our ideas and our perspectives on life, well, they're right. I figured everything out, many people will say. But this verse says, don't boast about who you are and what your achievements are. Don't be a self-praising individual. You think you got everything right. Recognize that before the Almighty, who sees with purer eyes than any other human being, we are all guilty. We are all flawed. There's nothing really to commend us before the Almighty and Holy Judge of Heaven. We are undone. We must humble ourselves rather than promote ourselves before him. A third thing about the earthly-minded person, the unconverted, is that so often they do not like to be challenged. Look at verse 3. A stone is heavy, the sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Well, this is a Descri a description here, a picture of someone who is not in control of their passions. That's the parable, the picture, a heavy stone, something that you can't really move. When it comes down upon your foot, you feel the weight of it. Sand here, probably the sense is a sack of sand, something that is arduous to carry very inconvenient and says the parable a fool's wrath is heavier than both of these well, what is a fool's wrath someone who gets very impassioned very angry uh, very perturbed when actually if they stopped and thought they have no reason to be angry 
but every reason to re reflect and consider on what has been said to them. Many unconverted people have what this verse calls a fool's wrath. They have their views of life. They have their conception of what God is like. And if anyone questions their ideas, their religious ideas, they soon become very uptight and impassioned and you get a heavy response from them. I remember, I've told you, many of you this before, I remember once there was an elderly lady, she came here for one service, and uh, she heard the message, and she said to one of the church officers, I think it was afterwards, that preacher implied that I'm a sinner. How dare he say something like that? I'm a, I'm a decent person. I'm a religious person. And yet the preacher implied that there's the sin in me. There is. There's sin in all of us. How many there are, if you suggest to them that God has every right to condemn them eternally for the way they've lived, they will fly into a rage, they will get all hot under the collar, they will have a a, a, a wrath, uh, a sense of, of injustice and feeling affronted for what they've heard, the diagnosis of themselves. Then there are others. They may not be religious people at all. But when you suggest to them that there is a deep flaw in their whole approach to life because they're living for the here and now, they give no thought of their accountability to a mighty creator, when you suggest to them that there are standards, not man's standards, not our own opinions, but the absolute standards of the maker of heaven and earth, they become very resentful. You see, why is that? Why is it that people become so t tense and so easily offended when they hear the teaching of God's word. Well, it's because we are vulnerable. Particularly if our life plan is challenged, we are so fragile. The vast majority of people in our society, they approach life with the premise that everything that there is to be done is to be done in this life. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. Get the most out of life. Pamper yourself. Live it your way. Because you'll die. You don't know when. But you might as well immerse yourself. Be materialistic. Be a pleasure seeker. Get all the entertainment you can. Because your life will be the end of you. And when someone comes along and says, that's a very foolish mistake to make. You're made in the image of God. You're given a conscience, a never dying soul. And this life is not the end. It throws into confusion the very bedrock of their approach to life. And so they become very angry and very perturbed and disturbed by the testimony that they've heard. Self-righteousness is disturbed in some. Well, you're not as good as you think you are because God's standards are not the standards of morality that society accepts and confers decency upon you. God's standards are absolute standards. One sin is enough to demonstrate that we have broken God's law and that we need his mercy. People become very upset and that seems to be implied here by verse 3 there's a fourth trait that's intimated here look at verse 4 wrath is cruel anger is outrageous but who is able to stand before envy now the the earthly minded person so often becomes envious now, of course, again, this is a parable, remember? 
there is a, a very ordinary application of this verse. Some people would say, well, I can deal with an angry man when he loses his temper, but someone who has that underlying sense of envy, they've got that jealous eye. It's like a, something that eats at their very character. It goes on and on and on. It's very difficult to answer, very difficult to address. Well, that is the picture. But there is an envy that takes place deep within. It's a kind of spiritual envy. Envy is very closely connected to self-pity. Let me explain what I mean. There's a kind of prejudice in an unconverted person who doesn't know the Lord. Their greatest need is to submit to the Lord. And yet envy is a kind of barrier in this way. Our minds will say something like this sometimes. When it's all very well to so and so, to be, become a Christian and to submit to the Lord, they've had a very easy life. They seem to be blessed with wealth and a, a settled family and they've got many gifts. They've got everything going for them. Of course they can submit. But why should I submit to God when he's given me such a rough hand in life? I've had difficult parents. I've had tr a troubled upbringing. I've now got a very sorrowful situation. Why should I submit to the Lord? There's a kind of envy. And many people will answer when they first hear the gospel. Why should I submit to a God who has, who has permitted me to have such a, a miserable existence? Oh, what a shame. What a sadness that those who think like that real, do not realize that the God whom they refuse to submit to is able to bless them richly. It doesn't mean that God in his sovereignty will bless everyone with wealth in this life or health or even a happy family, but the Lord is able to give lasting blessings, untold eternal favors, to those that seek him. There's another kind of envy, and that is the envy that looks at someone who has become a Christian and known the favor and mercy of God, and yet their background was most despicable. That was a problem in the days when the Lord Jesus Christ was here upon earth, the Pharisees. The religious people, they looked at whom the Lord Jesus Christ mixed with and they said he's a friend of the tax collectors, those who for the most part are crooks, who take and exact of the people more tax than they should and pocket the difference. He's a friend of the harlots, the, the women who have an unprincipled life and many skeletons in their cupboard, and yet the Lord receives them and blesses them and confers upon them forgiveness. And there's a kind of envy that says, I've been a very upright person, and yet they have just as much right to the mercy of God as I do. I will not accept such a God. It can be such a, 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 a barrier let me ask, is that a barrier to some of us this evening? We're resentful, either of how the Lord has dealt with us, or we're resentful that others who, by human measurement, do not deserve the favor of God, are brought into the kingdom of Christ ahead of us. Who is able to stand before envy? The Lord, in one sense will not stand before envy. We have to drop our prejudice. We have to drop our self-pity and our envy and resentment at others and come empty-handed, acknowledging that we are unworthy. And when we seek the Lord in that humble, 
sincere way, the Lord will bless us, just as he blesses others. Fifthly, the unconverted person, the earthly-minded person, the natural man, as I've phrased this evening, or the natural woman, are often hostile to open rebuke. Look at verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Now, there's a little confusion over this verse. Some people say, well, what is open rebuke? Does it mean a public dressing down where I'm called to the front of a large congregation and somehow all my, uh, my misdemeanors are exposed and challenged? Well, it could mean that. But the sense here is probably something like this. A rebuke which is complete openness of heart, not in a public way, but where the speaker, the rebuker, is completely frank and tells us all that we need to, ne to know and holds nothing back, a no-holds-barred kind of approach to challenging our thinking and our faults and our failings. None of us like that, do we? To be rebuked. And of course, the word of God does rebuke us. In our unconverted state, we like to be flattered. We like to be told, you're on the right lines. You're doing the right thing. That's our natural psyche. And many people in this world, that's why they love to hear the leading lights of the day. There's no God. Don't trouble yourself. If you follow earthly things, possessions and pleasures, all will be well. You feel flattered. I've got everything right in my life. You're a good person. Many people like to hear that. But this verse speaks of open rebuke. That's better than secret love. To be told all your faults and failings, to be told where you're going wrong, it may feel something that we don't instinctively warm to, and yet it's a great blessing. The word of Christ rebukes us. It faithfully lays before us our guilt and our sin. It speaks of the ugliness of sin. The word of God, no holds barred, describes our sin as being like a disfiguring disease that touches every part of our makeup, our thought life, our desires, our will, our understanding, our character traits. All has been ruined by sin, like a creeping disease that disfigures every feature of a person's face and all their physical faculties. It's not a pretty picture. We may say, I can't accept that that's me. But that's how we appear to the Lord. It's kind of open, frank assessment of our lives that humbles us. It's a rebuke. We don't like to hear it, at least first time over. It shows sin. The word of God shows us the unreasonableness of our sin and hostility to God. It's rebellion. That's the way the Bible describes our sin. Rebellion against the great God, the mighty God before whom we are all subject and exposed to his hand. He can end our life in a moment. The Bible would say we deserve it to be ended. This evening, we don't like to hear such things, but that's the word of God. It rebukes the folly of our sin, to sin against a God who is gracious and good and kind and merciful, to sin against the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior who came into this earth and endured 
unimaginable pain and suffering in order to redeem us from our guilt and sin and a lost eternity. And yet we spit in his face and say, I want nothing to do with this Christ. I don't want to hear his word. I won't pray to him. I won't humble myself before him and seek his mercy. The Bible speaks of how foolish that is. It's a kind of open rebuke. We don't like it. And yet it's faithful counsel. Look at the next verse. It's linked to it. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Is that how you see Christ? Do you look at the Bible? And when it sort of touches the raw nerve of our soul and it exposes our, our wretchedness before God, we say, I can't accept this. Are we going to be filled with a rage and with a resentment? Or do we say, this is the word of a God who desires my, my, well, my well-being. It's a message from heaven. It's the message of a, a well-meaning physician of my soul. Are we offended when the doctor tells us, well, I'm afraid, sir, you've got a serious malady. You've got a serious condition. You need to change your lifestyle. You've got to give up some of those habits that are not helping your health. Do you say, how, how dare you, as a doctor, say those things to me? I can't give up my chocolate. I can't give up my drinking. No, we would say, even if it's a struggle, we would say, the doctor has my best interests at heart. And so it is when the scriptures point out the picture of our sinful need before the Lord. The end of verse 6, look at this. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. We're running out of time. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The world is an enemy. It's an enemy of our eternal interests. And yet it kisses us. It says, follow me. I'm talking here about the, the godless world in which we live. The narrative of this world is, follow me. Imitate me. Take your fill of all the amusements that I present to you. And yet when we come to a deathbed, what will the world do? It will abandon us. It has no comfort, no hope, no future to offer us. It is like the kisses of an enemy. Well, time has nearly gone. I wanted to look at one or two more things here, but move on briefly to verse 10. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Who is the greatest friend that we can ever have? That friend is the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon wrote these words to his son, he was the friend of God, and he knew God as a friend. And he's commending to his son here, but to all of us really, the living God. And above all, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. This is our greatest need. Yet the unconverted person, the natural man, he would forsake Christ. He would kick Christ out of his life, have no thought, no regard, no prayer to the only Saviour. But let me set before you this evening, before we close, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a friend, firstly, in that he reveals our greatest need. Deliverance from our sin, its guilt, its pollution, its power to ruin us. He came into this world and he said to his disciples, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus Christ did. But you could argue that he laid down his life for those who at least in their attitude were his enemies, all of us. 
in our natural state, we are at enmity with Jesus Christ. Our hearts are cold and indifferent toward him. We have no real regard or esteem for all that he did in order to pay the price of sin. And yet he laid down his life that he may bring us to God, that we might be reconciled to a holy father, that all our sins should be washed away, that we should be graciously received and blessed with eternal life, hope of heaven to come, a place in the family of the living God. What a great friend is Christ. Is he your friend? Will you listen to the wise words that ultimately he speaks through these verses? Or are we determined to have our own way? Are you boasting that you have so much more in this life to do? Before you think about your soul, boast not of tomorrow. You don't know what a day may bring forth. Are you confident that you've got everything right? You're on the right lines. You won't heed anything that challenges your viewpoint. Then think again. Scripture shows us a better way. Christ points out the better way. Well, may the Lord bless these things to us this evening and give us that humble, receptive heart that says, we need to know, we need to heed the counsel that comes from the word of God and from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we acknowledge that so often when we hear the message of the Bible, our hackles can be raised. It touches a raw nerve. It exposes and humbles us. We ask, Lord God, give to us a readiness to heed the wise words of Scripture. Humble us and cause us to come to Christ and to acknowledge our broken and guilty state and our need of his forgiving grace and power. Lord, work in any this evening who've been touched by the power of these things and draw them to thyself that they may know the, the preciousness of the only Saviour in whose name we ask. Amen. We close our worship this evening with him.